So, well, uh, I'm honored. I'm very honored to, to be here even, uh, even via the big screen. I'm uh, certainly hopeful that in the future that I will be able to uh, come and be there with you in person. Uh, but grateful for the opportunity uh, that uh, Rabbi Henry has uh, given me to speak. You know, when I look at the uh, list of people that you have speaking, many of which have been dear friends for many years, uh, at times uh, you wonder what, you know, what, what more that you have to contribute. But I, I guess uh, being a psychiatrist has uh, certainly um, given me the opportunity to see this, uh, the, the how coming to some understanding of the nature of the principles of mind, thought, and consciousness uh, has, uh, has a, profound, uh, a profound effect. And uh, so when Rabbi Henry and I were talking, he indicated that he wanted me to address why these three universal principles, which, you know, Sid often called them the divine principles, uh, that why, why are they important to psychiatry? Um, which in, in fact, they're, they're universal, formless, spiritual principles that have implications to everything, literally everything. Um, that's why Mr. Banks could speak to PhD physicists from MIT for three days and then have them ask if uh, he could be come back for another three days. So I think God certainly has a sense of humor on uh, who he uh, lets uh, peek into the divine mysteries. And uh, I think, I think Mr. Banks was allowed to, to do that. So um, it's important that, that I, I give a disclaimer that I ask you to, to listen as quietly as you can, as I'm sure people have asked before. Um, and, and to know that I'm going to be doing my best not to talk to your intellect, but to, but to talk to that place within us all where we're connected and deeply um, present with the divine energy of life. Um, so I, I will do my best to do that. And I ask that you take what is helpful to you and, and what isn't. Um, we all speak of this in a, in a different way. And uh, I don't have any claim that the way that I see it be the way it is. It's just the best that I've been able to uh, come up with from my 32 years of exposure uh, to the principles. So um, I hope that there's something for each of you that will be helpful and meaningful. I'm going to just at least mention, I know they've been said before, but I'm going to speak to the, um, the principles. But before I do that uh, and define the, the three um, principles as I see them um, very quickly, I, I am a psychiatrist. I'm, I've been in psychiatry uh, for uh, 40, uh, 41 years, and uh, I've been a physician for 46 years. I um, uh, was exposed, first met uh, the, Mr. Banks through my good friend, Dr. George Pransky in 1983. And I will say that even though I had degrees all over my wall, and many of you have heard me say this, that, that said I was a mental health pr practitioner, I was not a mental health practitioner. I was a mental illness practitioner. <laughs> Uh, true, true, and and uh, uh, sadly, I think that's where the profession has been. I, I, in my five years of residency, had zero lectures on mental health, and yet they called me a mental health professional. One second, Bill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did somebody go into arrest or something uh, on that statement? Or? <laughs> if we could just, uh, if everybody could just say a small prayer right now that we make it through this, <laughs> that'd be great. Okay. Did I do something wrong? <laughs> Can you, should I speak more or not? You're good, you're good. Okay. <laughs> and, um, 
And I myself had struggled uh, from probably age 18 to 41 intermittently with depression, with clinical depression. I was never hospitalized, but I certainly was miserable uh, a lot. I saw seven different psychiatrists. Uh, and I don't mean that to scare anybody, but I did. I, I was looking for answers, and I, they were nice people. Every one of them was a, was a good person who I think truly wanted to be of assistance, but not one of them um, taught me anything that truly made life gentler for me or allowed me to access the innate mental well-being that God had placed there at, from the beginning. Uh, and so, so here I was, somebody who had almost, because of his depression, not made it out of college, almost not made it out of medical school, almost not made it out of residency. And here I was uh, touting myself as a mental health professional. When I met Mr. Banks, I knew immediately that he knew something that I didn't know. And I um, became a student as best as I could of these three principles principles of mind, which he, he, would, he would say that mind, the intelligent energy of all things, either in form or formless, uh, what else could that be uh, but, but God? Uh, what we talk of is that unexplainable, undefinable uh, thing that we label as God. Thought is the power, the gift the, to create um, that we use as a creative agent as we go through life. From, from birth to death, our experience is one thought at a time, like a kaleidoscope. We're using this divine power that, that God used to create the universe. We're using it to create our experience moment to moment as we go through life. And consciousness, that gift of awareness that takes what we think and makes it look real. Whatever we think looks real to us. It's just the way it works. It's the, it's the special effects department that we have that people like Steven Spielberg would, uh, would be envious of because it's uh, pretty hard to duplicate even with all their skills. And yet there's levels of consciousness. There's levels of awareness, levels of understanding of these principles that has incredible ramifications. Uh, you know, Mr. Banks would say, as we, as we rise in our level of understanding or our levels of consciousness, we experience more love, more compassion, uh, more understanding, more gratitude daily in life. Uh, as Viktor Frankl, uh, so with such wisdom, said something to the effect, I found it valuable and healthy to focus on what's left rather than what's lost. And I think certainly even as I get into my mid-70s, um, I find that important. Um, I find that important to remember, to be grateful for what's left rather than what is, is, has been lost or given back, if you will, given that it was all a gift in the first place. Um, so why is this important to psychiatry? Well, it's incredibly important because... Uh, the the definition of the word principle, by the way, it's interesting. It's a Latin word, and it's easy to to say that it means the, the, that which is at the source. But if you think of it in Latin roots, it actually means the first chief. Uh, prince, print, P R I N being first, and Sipla being from chief. So who? What else could be the first chief except that which we call God? You know, in fact, in the, in the big Webster's Dictionary, the unabridged version of principle, it, it goes for many, many paragraphs. But the last word is God. That that's the first chief. That's, the, that's that myster, mystery that we all try to understand. And that Mr. Banks' message was that a very spiritual message, that we are... We are these principles. We are made of, of divine energy. And he makes a point that it's not just the inside, but even our, the form that we're in, that all form is a manifestation of divine energy in disguise. That has incredible ramifications for psychiatry. 
because that means when I sit with a client, no matter what they're saying or how they're presenting or what circumstances they're in or what things they've done or have been done to them, that I'm in the presence of divinity. I'm in the presence of divine energy. And that energy has perfect wisdom at its, at its source. That has incredible ramifications that every moment of our life, not just a select few, but every single human being has access to divine wisdom to guide them through life with grace, with ease, with even most difficult times that uh, it has, the, we are guided. And to me, it's even more than that. As I see psychiatry and I see that people at different levels of consciousness, you can see that, that we still have been given a free will. We have been given a free will. So, so we can get lost. We can use this power of mind in a very personal way to create innocently, innocently, innocently create pain. Um, and we know how we're using these gifts moment to moment by our feeling level. It's, it's, it's a feedback. It's, it's, it's a, we are walking biofeedback machines. And we can uh, get, we get literally feedback every moment of our life of how we're using these gifts of mind, thought, and consciousness. And it's important that we're gentle with ourselves, that we, that we know that we're doing the best we can. Now, some people have difficulty with that premise, but to me, these three principles are like the Pythagorean theorem. They're, they're a statement of, of powerful truth. Um, and if you remember from the Pythagorean theorem, then from that there are many, many corollaries or obvious truths. And, and to me, it's the same way with these three principles. They're even more, if you will, fundamental than the Pythagorean theorem. That there are corollaries, obvious truths. And one of those obvious truths is that at the core of being human is being a ball of divine loving energy in disguise that's what, that has total wisdom to live life in a, in a wise and, and caring way. It also, to me, one of the, the corollaries is that there is psychological innocence that Mr. Banks talked about, psychological innocence, that people are, and I, and I remember when I first heard uh, Dr. Pransky and I heard Dr. Mills talk about that, it took a while for me to truly appreciate that as I listened to people from a, place of non-judgment, that I saw that people, no matter what they had done, in the moment, it had made sense to them. It was the choice that they made, given their level of understanding and the feeling level that they were in at that time. And that, that seeing psychological innocence, have you lost me? <laughs> Should I continue? Yeah, I'm just going to mute somebody. Okay. Seeing psychological innocence really, um, to me, is important that people are truly doing the best that they know how to do each moment. Um, and to know that that place of mental well-being cannot be injured, it cannot be scarred, it cannot be cannot be damaged because it's spiritual. It can't be affected by genes or heredity. Uh, so many people that I know, myself included, I still have the same genes. I still have a strong family history of depression. I still have a considerable family history of alcoholism. But if I understand the principles and I use them in a way that, uh, that, allows me to continue to live in a positive feeling state, then I am not going to activate uh, or manifest 
uh, those, those genes, if you will, are those heredity because there's a level of understanding that is beyond that. Um, again, psychiatry, it gives incredible hope. There are so many people that uh, come to, to uh, the psychiatrist and, and they don't have hope. You know, in fact, my, I was discussing with Rabbi Henry uh, a few days ago when we were preparing that when a, I, I work now about half time in the clinic, about 10 days a month, and every patient that comes into my office, the first discussion I have is one of hope because they, you, typically they walk in and they have a 10, 15, 20, 25 year history of of not having any hope, of feeling uh, depressed, anxious, uh, and, and, and totally hopeless that, that they could ever find peace. And one of the things that I do very early on is in the, uh, as we get to meet each other is to let them know what the object for me of this initial interview is. Uh, and the, I tell them my goal is that when you walk out from this initial interview, you will have substantially more hope that you can be at peace and live in a peaceful state of mind, a loving state of mind, much more of the time than you ever dreamt of. And I can see on people's faces, their, their, their face of, um, of disbelief that that could be possible. That, that how could that happen in the next 75 minutes or next hour and 70, or 75 minutes or so? And, and I, I often try to stay lighthearted with it. I, I tell them that the other thing that I want is that, that we have an honest relationship, but that also keeps that they're in charge, that if I ask them a question that they don't feel comfortable answering, that they just let me know that and that I'm really there to be in service to them. And uh, that would be fine. I will, not, I will not feel ill will towards them. But I do ask also that if they choose to answer my question, that they are honest with me as I'm going to be honest with them. And so then I say, so that even applies at the end of this meeting. When I ask you, did we reach the goal of of you having substantially more hope that you can be at peace. I said that it's not okay for you to say, oh, this poor old fat psychiatrist, I don't want to ruin his day, so I'm going to tell him uh, that, that I did, uh, uh, even though I didn't. And, I, and we laugh, and I say, that's not okay. It's important that, we, that you're honest with me even about that. And it's, it is so wonderful. It's when I, you wish that somebody was watching or had a videotape of, of people when they walked in versus when they walk out. Because it's in the cards. It's not that I... <laughs> this sounds so self-serving because it sounds like I have some magic wand or anything. I, I don't. I, I, I have a, a smidgen of understanding of these three universal divine principles. And it's, it's what everybody is made of. And so when I point to what's true, it resonates with the truth that's inside of them. And even though the intellect may fight it and the ego may fight it, you know, I love, I love the quote, many of you have heard me say it many times, but Albert Einstein, who was, you know, certainly the greatest scientist since, uh, since Newton. He said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. That's a powerful statement. I, th I think he was quite aware that there was, there was this wisdom that could be accessed and that was a sacred gift that had been given to all of us. <laughs> and he said... Are we still okay? <laughs> she 
Shall I continue? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, uh, is this it? Rabbi Henry, is this a test? <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, I don't want you to get too full of yourself. You know? Yeah, I, I thought maybe this was a test, a stress test or something. <laughs> maybe there was a secret monitor of my blood pressure and pulse. Or... <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> let me see if I can remember where I was. Uh, can you help me? Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. He said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. And he said, the rational analytical mind, it's faithful servant. Wow. It's faithful servant. He said, however, we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Knowing that that wisdom is available and trying to guide us through life every moment is, is as the MasterCard ads used to say, is priceless. That we have that resource, that divine wisdom available to us every moment of our lives when we get lost and don't know. You know, I once, I once heard a statement that a client told me that, that she saw on a, on a, on her her Christian calendar, I think, or some calendar, but but it, it's all it's universal. I think it's true. It's true universally. And the statement was that man is the only of God's creatures that goes faster when it's lost. Man is the only of God's creatures that goes faster when it's lost. It certainly was true for me until I was exposed to the principles that when I was lost and didn't know what to do, I ran around in circles, often both mentally and physically. And yet, what does, a, what does an animal do when it's lost? If it's not being chased, if it's just lost, an animal stops. It stops cold. And it listens. And it's just aware until it knows where to go again. And then once it knows, it goes and goes forward. And I think that's priceless to know that. Now, I'm aware that I haven't given, like I often do, examples. And, and I, I don't know that that's what I, what the thing to do. If there's questions, I can do that. But I can tell you that as a psychiatrist, in the last 40 years, or last 32 years since I've learned the principles, I have seen people who had the diagnosis of schizophrenia. I've seen people who were in the midst of a, of a full-blown manic episode. I've seen people who were depressed for over 40 years. I've seen people who have struggled with panic attacks since their early childhood or late, late you know, early uh, 10, 12 years old. I've seen all of those people gain a profound level of peace that they had never before dreamt possible. And it isn't, again, because of uh, any, anything magical that I have. I would, they would often, when I would present them at grand rounds, or, or at, they would often say, you know, he, he really... Dr. Pettit really didn't do that much, and it was true. All I did was point them to the truth that was within them. And I also pointed them to Mr. Sidney Banks' videos and books. This is the man to me that God blessed with an insight that was profound, very profound. And, and so he wrote, you know, this man who had a ninth grade education and had only read four books in his life, there were welding books. 
after he left school in the ninth grade. He was a, he was a welder. He was a master welder. Um, and for him to have been given this powerful insight that, that then he read book, he actually wrote six books and made videotapes. Finally, uh, as many people know, he, he was reluctant to be videotaped because he said, this is not about me. It's not about me. It's about people realizing their divine inheritance, that they are divine energy and that they're using divine energy to become aware of that and that and to go through life in a in a loving and caring way uh, but to me to refer people to those videos and books has been so often um, I, I had I, I now in my practice um, where I still prescribe medications when they're needed but I have told people in order for me to remain their psychiatrist, that the minimum is for them to watch the, the four Long Beach videotapes of Mr. Banks twice through. They're approximately 30 to 33 minutes, the first three, and I think the last one is 45 minutes. And they say, why twice through? And I say, because the second time through, you will have the second time through, you will be listening with different eyes and ears than you did the first time through. And last week, last Tuesday, when I was at my cl the clinic, I'm now, I just started there in November, so I'm starting to see people because, uh, by the way, those four videos that I mentioned are all on the, the three PGC, the Three Principles Global Community website. They're all there. There's no... There's no cost. They're free. And so people have been watching them at their home. And in some homes, the grandparents, one home, the, the two grandparents, the two teenagers, the mother and father have all watched them and are going through the second time. But this past Tuesday, I happened to have three individuals who had finally sat down since it was available on their computer and watched these four videos twice. And frankly, all of them had tears in their eyes as they sat there telling me, Dr. Pettit, I thought you were full of poop when you told me that, that um, watching videos could make a difference. And it, it's not the videos, it's just that they pointing the clarity that Mr. Banks points to that which is within us, to that which we are made of. The clarity of that speaks to that so loudly that it awakens that. And all three of them with tears in their eyes told me that for the first time in their life, since a small child, that they had awakened hope that they could live at peace at a very profound level. That was very moving to me. The, the, young, the medical assistant who, who uh, does the blood pressure and pulse and uh, that before they, she brings him back to me was very touched because they, they would say to her, have you watched these videos? You need to watch them. So I encourage you to, to do that, to listen with a quiet mind as, as with as little... Uh, is little, in, uh, let your analytical mind uh, do whatever it does and thank, it, thank your brain for sharing its comments, you know. Um, when Mr. Banks talks about that, it's important for us to see that the mind is, is spiritual and the, the brain is biological. The brain is, is like a computer. What you put in, you get out. And, and, and the brain acts like a computer. So when we face uncertainty in our life, the brain is going to go to its archives and, and think of anything possible that might happen, that we should be aware of. And that manifests as having what we'll call worrisome thoughts. Well, what if this happens? Well, what if that happens? What if, what if, what if? 
And the wonderful thing about what ifs is that they multiply faster than any creatures alive. Every what if will have three baby what ifs within seconds. And so if you leave a couple of what ifs commingling in your head for more than a few minutes, you will have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of what ifs. And there are people who literally spend many, many hours every day in worry about what might happen. And while they're doing that, they lessen their ability to deal with what, what does happen. And they're not in their life. My, my late wife, Sue, that some of you were fortunate to know, um, used to say, I'm, moment to moment I realized that I'm either in my thoughts or I'm in my life. Either I'm in my thoughts or I'm in my life. And one is, one is very stressful and the other is very wondrous and glorious. And I think that's where we want to be, is to be in our lives, moment to moment. And people ask me, they say, don't you worry. Don't you worry. And I say, well, I don't, I'm not aware that I do. I have worrisome thoughts. Well, they say, well, what do you do when your head gets full of worrisome thoughts? And I say, well, I, I ask myself one question. Is there something I can do about that right now? And certainly having served as, uh, as the chief of psychiatry at the nuclear submarine base when I was in the Navy in 1977 to 1980, I was the chief of psychiatry. The nuclear people at nuclear bases with, nuclear, with, with the nuclear submarines, they, they have to deal with the what ifs. What if there was a leak? What if this happened? And so they have plans, and there's nothing wrong with having plans. And you do the best you can to deal with whatever worrisome thought comes to mind. You might, uh, you make plans. But after you've done that, we all live in uncertainty. And af if, after you've done what you see to do, to me, the best preparation for the unknown is to be in a positive feeling present each moment. The other thing that has been helpful to me as far as, and helpful to people as they see the principles at a deeper and deeper level. And I think it's important to, to recognize that these three principles easily, easily defined, the principle of mind, of divine mind, the intelligent energy of all things, as, as we went over it, thought, the creative agent we use to go through life, and consciousness, that gift of awareness, that, that as Sid used to say, you could teach a parrot or a four-year-old to repeat those, those simple definitions, but to truly see the nature of these principles deeper and deeper, he would say is an infinite, an infinite journey. And, and, and that, that brings me to something that, that I think has been very helpful to me. Having gone through those 23 years of depression, It used to be until I met Mr. Banks in 19, uh, in, in Dr. Pransky or introduced me to Mr. Banks in 1983. Until that time, any time that I would find myself in emotional pain, I would become frightened. And the reason I would become frightened is because my brain would start spitting out things like, whoops, Looks like you're going into a depression again. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're going to go into a depression again. And I would get frightened. And I would start scrambling and thinking faster instead of getting quiet and listening to wisdom. I would try to think my way out of it. And pretty soon I would end up down and depressed and confused and getting to be what I call righteously miserable. See, I was right. I'm depressed. <laughs> and now, if I become, start to feel emotional pain, if I truly believe, which I do, 
I, and maybe it's arrogant to say that I know, but it's, it seems that way, that I know, I don't just believe it, that I know the only person and the only thing that can create emotional pain for me is the person that's in my underbritches. And last I looked, there's only me. <laughs> so if I truly am the only one that can cause, be causing emotional pain for me, when I experience uh, that my feeling level has dropped, that I'm actually in what I'll call emotional pain, I mean, we all have some fluctuations, but there's, there's fluctuations and then there's fluctuations. And when I start to feel emotional pain, I, I frankly, I get excited now. And people say, pardon me? You get excited when you get emotional pain? And I say, yes, I do. Because I know that I have an opportunity. I'm being given an opportunity to see something that I haven't seen about the nature of the principles. That if I allow my mind to quiet, it's in the cards for wisdom to help me go through a couple of more of the infinite doors of understanding of these three principles of mind, thought, and consciousness. And that's exciting. You know, I've been told I have a physician friend who's from China, and I asked him about this, and he said it was true that the symbol for, for crisis, the Chinese symbol for crisis, is two symbols put together. One symbol is the symbol of danger, and the other is the symbol of opportunity. And so when I think of um, having emotional pain, I see it as, as a minor crisis, but I see it now as an opportunity, an opportunity to see more rather than to take myself in a cascade down uh, to a lower and lower feeling level that I did in the past with complete innocence, complete innocence. I think seeing psychological innocence has allowed me to have compassion for people. It's allowed me to truly have compassion for people. And now, it doesn't mean that you don't use good judgment. Uh, it doesn't mean that if every time you trust somebody that, that they, um, they cheat you or they, they do wrong to you, it doesn't mean that you continue to do business with them, but it also means to me that I know that that person is not in a peaceful state of mind because I've never seen anybody who was in peaceful, loving, joyful state of mind be hurtful to another human being in any way. I've only seen both myself and others that have inflicted pain in others when they themselves were in pain. So again, it, it doesn't mean that you don't protect yourself and your family and, and whatever, but it means that you don't have to feel ill will towards people that are lost. As Mr. Banks says, you start to see that, that the lostness and the, and the innocence of those who, who might harm you. And it, it allows you to keep a feeling of well-being and love and gratefulness that, that keeps you in direct line to wisdom. You know, I often tell people that wisdom is like, um, it's like a beautiful harp playing or a, a beautiful instrument. I I'd somehow thought of a lyre, I, I, and I don't know that I even know what that is, but I think of it as a, be a beautiful quiet musical instrument and we here at in Michigan they have the winningest college football team as you as you may know even though they've been on some hard times in recent years and they have a, a marching band a huge marching band and they have a stadium of 114,000 people 
that they fill for their home games. And I often tell people, just as you can't hear a harp playing, if you have the Michigan marching band playing in your head, you can't hear wisdom if you're thinking at 200 miles an hour, trying to figure it out with your analysis and your analytical thinking. And it's not that analytical thinking is evil or bad. It's just that there are many, many situations in life that don't, um, the answer doesn't come from analysis. And I'm talking about relationships, whether it be with husband and wife or brother and sister or father and children. To me, love and understanding trumps analysis 100% of the time. So I'm going to stop. It's about five minutes to 11. Uh, and I'm going to stop, and, and I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Bedit. Um, you can hear me okay, yeah? Very clearly. Great. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the questions up to the floor, and then I'm not sure if you're going to hear them sufficiently from them, or I'll relay them, okay? so I think that would be great to have you relay them, I think. Okay. Yes, we have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you hear that? I did not. Okay. So um, the question was, can you, uh, you spoke about working with patients with the principles that were dealing with schizophrenic, the schizophrenic or manic episodes. Um, she, the question was, how, can you elaborate a little bit more on how the principles uh, assisted people and whether or not you ended up uh, taking down or removing medication as a result? You know, for, first of all, let me say, I have worked most of the time as a solo person, as many of, many of my wonderful friends there have worked in agencies and places where they were the only one. What, what Dr. Mark Howard achieved at Kaiser is a, is a testimony to one person's steadfastness in the spiritual nature of, of human beingness. Um, but like Mark, uh, I also you know, worked in agencies where I was the only one. And over time, typically uh, you would have nurse, uh, one nurse or two nurses that started to see the transformations. But I want to say before I answer the question, think of what it would be like if some benefactor with all these billions of dollars that some people have took 50 million and built a three principles psychiatric hospital where everybody in there from the psychiatrist to the psychologist to the nurses to the people in, in uh, the, the social workers to the people that swept the floors to the people that, that, that worked in the kitchens that everybody had been exposed to and the nature, the nature of these three principles and lived in, in a, the vast majority of the time in a loving, joyful feeling. I think that miracles would, what people call miracles now, would be become the standard of what a mental health hospital, uh, the clear potential of what could happen in a mental health hospital. I think, I think that day is going to come. It quite likely will come after I have already passed from this phase of, of life. Uh, but I, I have a feeling that, 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 that that's going to happen. But, um, you know, I could tell stories, uh, and, I, and a couple of three just come to mind. Uh, one was only a few months, and I've shared this with some people, it's, and I'll, I'll make it quick, but uh, it was a man in a state hospital. It was only a few months after I'd met Dr. Pransky and Mr. Banks, and I uh, was in my home state of Illinois, and we had such a profound experience, my wife and I, my late wife and I, with... Um, with our parents where we saw them with such innocence and such love that we stayed there for a year. And I took a job in a state mental hospital 
and and there was a psychologist there as I talked about the principles and there was there was no books there was no videotapes at the time uh, and I was just talking about the principles and the psychologist kept telling me that I you know that again I uh, was feel full of poop you know that that this didn't make sense but he also kept asking me to come and and uh, have lunch with him and his anxiety condition which he had had for years suddenly disappeared after about six weeks and he asked me to come and be a co-leader in his group of people with chronic schizophrenia and some many of you have heard this and I won't I don't want to take too long but literally the third meeting of that group there was a man who had sat each of the times with his chair uh, askew talking and listening to uh, voices during the entire group and during this third group he suddenly started laughing at, at such a heartfelt human level that every single person in that group, including about 20 people with the diagnosis of chronic schizophrenia, and the co-leader and I were laughing, holding our stomach, our eyes were watering, and we didn't even know why we were laughing. And it went on for many minutes. And at the end of that time, this man named Herb, I kept saying, Herb, what is so funny? What is so funny? And finally, when he stopped after, I think it must have been between five and ten minutes of laughing just so hard, that he took his chair, he turned it around, he looked me right in the eye when I asked him, and he said, Dr. Pettit, I just realized that I have made myself crazy with my own thinking for nearly 47 years and I don't have to do it anymore. Wow. I, I, I think I just had tears come down my cheeks and I, and I didn't know what to say. It was such pure, there was such purity in that that wisdom that he had access that that he's made of had gotten past his his prison of thought that he had created and it took us four weeks to taper his medications and I don't frankly remember I think we tapered him off completely because he didn't he didn't need him he started having terrible side effects and uh, and he I had a three or four year follow-up where he was fine he was living at a an apartment and would go down to the senior center and play cards and dance. I had another young man that came in to the, to the, uh, and I, many of you have heard this story too, but he came into the clinic in 1984 in, in Coral Gables when I was working with Dr. Roger Mills and Dr. Rick Suarez. And he came into the clinic. He was about 16 or 17 years old. His parents were frightened that he was going to kill them during the night because he, he had threatened that he would kill, he might kill them during the night when they were asleep. And he was on 800 milligrams of Thorazine, which uh, again, when I, that was 30 some years ago, and that was still being used prominently. And 800 milligrams was a fair, fair amount of Thorazine. But even with that, he was sleeping only two to three hours. And, uh, and he was very threatening and hearing voices and having delusions. And after the first time that I saw him and explained as best as I could about these three principles, next time, and I, 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 over the next three visits, every time, I had to lower his medicines because he was no longer spending 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day dysregulating his biochemistry. And so we went down to, to 600. He was sleeping 12 to 14 hours a day. We went down to 400. We went down to 200. And his family never returned again. And, and even though they were the ones every time when I would say, what should we do? As he started seeing the, uh, the glimpses of the principles, uh, they, they would say, you have to lower his medicine, doctor. Look, at he can't even stay awake. Now, when I called them and asked them why they didn't bring him back, they said, because we're going to take him to somebody that really understands schizophrenia. Because we see what you're doing. You're trying to take him off his medicines. Now, isn't that amazing? 
that here they brought him in on 800 milligrams of Thorazine, threatening to kill them. And even though they had seen this transformation, you know, that young man, if I would have gotten to see him, he may have ended up needing 25 or 30 milligrams of Thorazine instead of 800. He might have needed that, depending on his level of understanding. But he might have then been able to go to college, to medical school, to get his PhD in research and become one of the top schizophrenia researchers in the country at the National Institute of Mental Health. So... My experience is that as people, the man that was in a full-blown manic episode that literally came out of his manic episode that he'd been in for three and a half weeks, came out of it right in my presence. It was, it was like he'd been hit by lightning. He just suddenly stopped after being awake for 40-some hours as we were talking. And, and the nurse said, you know, what happened? And I said, I think he's fine now i think he's he's fine and and i'm stopping all of his medicines and she said well you can't do that and of course that was the wrong thing to say to me because i i was able to stop his medicines and he was fine and he went home two or three days later and he required no medications after that the the nurse the first night uh gave him some but it was because she was anxious not because he was having any symptoms <laughs> You know, so, so I know what's possible. Now, for many people, there are levels of consciousness. I would have people that would get, I had one man that got down to about one-tenth. He had been on 160 milligrams of a medicine called loxetine, and he got down to like 15 milligrams. But he was afraid that if he got, if he kept coming, that he'd get to where he wouldn't need any medication and then he would lose his disability payment. <laughs> you know, and so he, he, and he was working, he was working now full time with his son's lawn care business. So because he was no longer bothered by his voices and hallucinations, because he was now at peace. You see, people that have that difficulty with hallucinations and having to go to another world, it's because... They've innocently created so much chronic mental stress. You know, as some of you may know, I'm, uh, uh, that I'm going to be doing this four-week four thing on, on uh, uh, Brett Chetty's, I don't know whether you're able to do this, but Supermind, where I'm going to talk about that really there's only one source of mental illness. It's called chronic mental stress. It's chronically taking this incredibly these gifts of mind, thought, and consciousness, and innocently, innocently using themselves against ourselves with worry, guilt, resentment, upset, overanalyzing, unresolved grief, envy, uh, drivenness, and, and taking away the gift of, of peace and joy that, that God has given us in an innocent way. Well, as we do that, as people do that 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, it has incredible ramifications biologically. And even now, the whole field of epigenetics, where when people get stressed out for more than 30 minutes, they literally start affecting their gene expression and often turning off healthy genes and health protective genes and activating illness genes. So, you know, that, that's what I'll say to that, that, that I, I had one lady who had been maintained on about 1500 milligrams of lithium that had kept her generally out of the hospital except every once in a while that once she got truly peaceful i had to keep lowering the lithium dose until we finally had to stop it completely because she could no longer take even a half a tablet without getting sick 150 milligrams she could not take without getting signs of what we would call lithium toxicity, uh, nausea, diarrhea, upset stomach, because why now, now her balance was coming from the inside, not from the outside. Biochemical imbalance can be starts with as little as two to three minutes of upsetting thinking. Now, if we stop after two to three minutes, our, we come back. We come back in less than two to three minutes. 
But if people get stuck in chronic state of mental stress, it has incredible ramifications for their physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. Uh, Dr. Pettit, I, I think that we're, uh, I think we're basically into our break. So um, I just want to take this moment to say thank you for uh, for being here with us this morning. Thank you. Um, I just I have a quick question for you. What's the temperature in Michigan right now? <laughs> You know, that's good. You know, the other night, it, I, I thought I'd been transplanted back to um, South Dakota, where I lived for uh, eight years and actually went to work one day when it was minus 36 with a wind chill of minus 54. Um, but uh, today it is one degree right now. Uh, thir Thursday evening, it's going to get down to minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit um, with the wind with wind chill in the minus 30s and 40s, so. You know, if you had come to New York, it would have only been 13 degrees. You know, <laughs> see, you missed out on a big warm spell over here. <laughs> yeah. What do they say? If the frog had wings, he wouldn't bump his butt, right? 